All right, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Parker, and I'm a member of the marketing team at the Perry Johnson Companies, and I'll be helping to facilitate today's webinar and offer support to the speakers. Today, we're joined by Safe Food and Root, and we have a full panel for you, so I'm going to hand it over to them now. Um, hello, uh, my name is Jennifer Crandall, and um, I am the CEO founder of Safe Food and Root. I've been a long time um, attendee and panelist on the Perry Johnson webinar series. Um, today, we are super excited because we're going to be talking about why you should love risk assessments. And um, so we've been having great conversations with our teams to, to figure out how to best present this to you. And I'm very excited to introduce to you Gary Bierick. He is a risk management expert, subject matter expert. Um, he has a background in finance and risk assessment with a degree from University of Delaware in financial management and an MBA from Loyola University, Maryland. He has 40 years total experience in his career and all of it includes risk assessment and risk management, um, including being a risk analyst, risk manager, chief risk officer, and an ERM pioneer and subject matter expert. His corporate experience has 18 plus years and he founded a Paradisoft RPM3 solutions in February of 20, uh, 2002. So we're super excited to have him on to have a fireside chat, basically conversation to talk about how we can use risk assessment in our day-to-day -day operations not just in the food safety realm. Um, again, my background, uh, for those that do not know me, I have a Purdue food science degree of 25 years in the industry, now it's 26. Um, I have manufacturing experience, uh, about eight years of that with production supervision, quality assurance. I've written HACCP and food safety plans uh, and done a lot of management and leadership positions. My corporate experience, I worked at corporate Kroger for 12 years. I managed mostly the supplier compliance in that time and vetted suppliers in all areas of compliance, including understanding direct imports. And I was the business lead in software development for the supplier hub that is currently being used. I'm also an FSBP expert uh, and learned that while I was at Kroger. I founded Safe Food and Root in March of 2018, so I'm coming up on our six year anniversary. And just in a few weeks, I'll be the recipient of the Purdue University Distinguished Alumni Award for Food Science and for the College of Ag, um, and also the Food Science Outstanding Alumni. So um, a little humble brag, I guess, but I'm pretty excited about that. It was a complete surprise to start getting it. I've also added a few more layers to my background of being land betterment corporations um, on their independent board of directors, as well as Omnibus Incorporated, uh, which is a pathogen detection system in under 30 minutes. And I recently became a Clockwork Certified Partner, which is a, a operational efficiency certification that's similar to Lean Six Sigma principles, but not as robust, it is more catered to the small and mid-sized businesses. So what are we all doing together? And why am I interviewing Gary Bjerk? Um, uh, basically, food, Safe Food and Root has partnered with Culture Advisory Group uh, out of Canada that is managed by Paul Valder and his team. And Gary is um, the owner of Aparitasoft, which is a software risk assessment software that we are going to be using to do risk assessments and readiness assessments. So currently we do still offer all the same services that we've done in the past, FSVP and supplier verification compliance solutions. We do food safety consulting to regulatory and GFSI schemes, offer training, label review, but now we are also offering software as a service using this readiness assessment tool. And you'll note that there is another company there called Nesis. We are also uh, working with their platform through the Culture Advisory Group. We're really excited to start offering these as services. Um, we also will be doing diligence assessments for food safety using those software. So a Paradisoft software, I'm currently designing a diligence assessment for that program. Okay, so let's get to know you a little bit and I'll turn it over to Parker to jump in and do the Poll question for us because we want to get to know our audience and see who are we talking to. Oh, 
Okay, somebody start talking because I can't see the polls, so I don't know how we're doing on responses. Well, we're coming in like 50% voted right now, so I'm going to leave it up for a, another minute or so. Okay. All right, you might have to read to me the results when they get there because I am still not seeing any of that. Um, but you there they are. Results are up. All right. So can you read them out to me so I can see? Because um, the audience can see them, but I cannot. Sure, I can read them to you. It's 8% uh, CEO, founder, 29% manager, director level, 54% food safety quality professional, and 8% other. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Parker. Um, so, uh, good to know. So, we have a lot of managers in the audience, and we have a lot of food safety professionals, which is not a surprise. That's our typical audience at Perry Johnson Registrars. And so, I'm excited. I want to share with you, you know, normally in food safety, we're pretty used to food safety risk assessments. And so, for the food safety professionals in the audience, you're probably wondering, um, you know, how can we talk about this differently? Um, and, and why am I bringing it up as a risk assessment? So in food safety, we're used to doing them. And we identify the hazards that are associated with foods and with the process and the facility that we're in. And then we typically do a rank risk based, uh, you know, risk based approach to the probability of that happening and then determine is there enough risk to need to mitigate a hazard through a, some type of kill step? And usually that's something like cooking, or it might be, as we are now doing um, preventive controls, we might be looking at, is there a way in the supply chain to manage it, the allergen management program, the sanitation program, et cetera. So that's, that's a normal thing. We are used to doing that. Uh, but there are a lot of other ways to do risk management, and people tend to avoid them um, because they don't really understand them fully. And so, um, you know, it's difficult to stay objective when you're evaluating situations when you're you know, looking at risk because it could mean that there's a monetary risk associated with it or it might mean that you have to deal with something that you've been avoiding. And so those sometimes are things that are hard. The other thing is there's a lot of people that have a lack of knowledge how to use risk to evaluate properly. So you can, you can actually use risk to make decisions and the probability of them to make decisions. And sometimes when we don't understand why a boss, and I, we can use these as plenty of examples out there, when a boss makes a decision and you just don't understand why did they go this route, it seems like a risky thing to ignore this situation. And we can all have numerous different examples of that happening, I am sure, like there would be a whole nother panel discussion on what decisions that our bosses make that we disagree with. Um, however, sometimes they have more information and they're doing a risk assessment that we're just not aware of. Um, and then the other piece of it is the lack of skill to use risk for prioritizing those actions. So I'm gonna um, turn over and ask some questions of Gary, who is our subject matter expert, 40 year plus professional on risk assessment. And he looks at it from all different angles. And I want him to start teaching us a little bit more about it. So I'm gonna turn it over to Gary and ask, you know, now that we've gotten to know that, we understand, right. let's let's first talk about it. What is risk, Gary? Well, that that's, it's, that's a great question, Jennifer. Um, I was asked the question uh, yesterday. Um, I was in a, in a uh, initial meeting, introductory meeting with someone and they, asked me the question, well, Gary, what, what do you consider what you do for a living? And my response was, I'm a linguist. <laughs> and they chuckled. And I'm like, well, what do you mean I'm, that you're a linguist? And I'm like, well, I mean, if you think about risk management, there are so many different paths to try to understand our risk. People are using different terminologies to accomplish the same end. So uh -huh. where you and I might say, uh, I want to find out what the probable events would be that would bring rise to uh, a loss in my organization. So you might call that a probable risk event. And mm -hmm. I might talk to Paul Valder and Paul, Paul will say, no, that's a risk, Gary. That's a risk, right? right. So the, the challenge then is how do we get on the same language? 
how do we get to the same nomenclature so that when we are addressing these things, everybody knows what we're talking about? Right. So if, if you're gonna ask me to step all the way up onto the mountain and say, well, what is risk? My favorite word or synonym is uncertainty. Okay, that's a really great way to look at it. Okay. And, and, so, and, yeah, and, and there's a big reason for that, right? Because if, if, you, if you're looking at trying to accomplish goals, how much risk is there to getting it done? If I'm trying to be profitable, how much risk is it to getting done? that's the term risk but that is not how it's not a, a a single path to that answer that's where the whole risk assessment thing becomes important i love the way you approach that and as a food safety professional i can say many food safety professionals in my career are food they're risk adverse we are mm -hmm. always going down the path of it the worst case scenario uh, and it, because that's our job, right? So we, our goal is to prevent people from getting sick yep. and to, to prevent them from dying. Like we have lots of examples in the food industry of that happening. And so we're very risk adverse, but there are times when risk, you know, that uncertainty might not be related to that. And, uh, you know, it's like, what's the probability of it and understanding that. So what, when you're doing, you know, you have uncertainty and you're looking at it from that perspective, what do you do as a risk assessment? Like, what is a risk assessment? What is appropriate to do? So, you know, being an ERM guy, when we were talking about uh, food safety standards, for instance, I would say that's all part of the Enterprise Risk Management Program. Yes. And many of the audience out there would say, well, what are you talking about? Right. How can that be? You know, I'm trying to be compliant with the standard. To, to have assurances, right? They'll use that word, to have assurances. Well, if mm -hmm. you really think about it, when you're looking at standards or you're looking at regulation or you're looking at any of those methods, somebody somewhere identified what the risks were, the events, the things we're worried about. And then they figured out what you need to have in place so that does not happen. Right. So they're kind of doing it in a backwards approach. They're saying, let's go see if you've got the things in place that make sure these bad things don't happen. And really what they're trying to do is to see if you've got exposure to certain probable risk events. Sure. Right? Now, here's your challenge. They can't be complete. That's a wonderful way to begin and it's a, a a great, it, it's an essential part of everyone's uh, approach to risk, but you also have to go around the other way and say, well, what else could happen that right. maybe the standard has yet to cover? Yes, yeah. So there's another angle to this whole thing that needs to be looked at. So risk assessment needs to be looked at pathways that lead you to what are the events that would bring rise to a loss and i can get there through known standards or i can get there through executive knowledge but either path leads me to what that risk might be yeah this identification is the most important part of this exercise what are they what are the things that we're worried about so the identifying the risk. So I'm looking at, again, kind of taking it back to our food safety perspectives because law requires us to look at some. So like for import regulations um, and for preventive controls, which are two laws that we have to follow in the US, we have to, like, we have to go check what is the FDA guidance of risk on this appropriate food. So if it's you know like this category of food and I, I don't i can pick numerous so let's just pick baked goods they will tell us exactly what type of risks to look for however what you're saying is we have to also identify risks that are not, that we don't necessarily see on that list and that might be something sure. related to the risks associated with that facility things that we know happen in that facility is that, am I interpreting right. it correctly? Unique environmental issues to one facility yeah. that are not on that list coming from the FDA. Sure, sure. 
and you so know what, your facility better than anyone you should yeah yeah but, so we can we can understand why risk assessment is important but we also need to understand that just taking one method doesn't mean you're safe right right absolutely okay I mean, so i've heard so many people say things where where oh uh after enron when they came up with the sarbanes oxley act and they started doing all these risk management things and then bad things kept happening why right well because if you give a prescribed uh, uh approach to looking at certain types of risk and you mandate that on an organization nine out of ten times they're going to do that and only that rather than think about this broadly as a value-based concept yes so there's so there when is you're doing food safety when i look at you jennifer and i think about oh my gosh you're a value creator okay right? <laughs> i'm listening <laughs> and, 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 and why because you're managing risk to brand you're managing yeah. risk to reputation you're managing all kinds of things that aren't necessarily specifically prescribed on an FDA list. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and and it, you're bringing up a, a valid point. And I'm going off script just a, just a second. There is argument out there. And I've shared this on the Perry Johnson uh, webinars in the past. And I also share it in lectures whenever I uh, talk to students. But there is argument out there that following a food safety standard actually um, creates this problem in the industry because it's so scripted that it takes away the ability for us to think outside of that scheme, outside of those yeah. requirements. And what you just said really reiterates it as well, you know, that nine out of 10 times when you have a prescribed approach, that's the only thing you're going to do. And I think in food safety, it's so important because we rely on government data, we rely on scientific data to tell us the risks that are associated with foods. But then it does kind of put our blinders on, we're checking the boxes and making sure that everything's okay there, but we aren't necessarily seeing the other potential risks, the emerging things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And even though the, the law does push us to do that, to think about it, but I, that conceptually doing it inside that bubble in your HACCP team or in your food safety team um, and in a cross sector of the organization, we have limited resources to be able to stay focused if we're not tapped in. And so I think of like our clientele as small and mid-sized businesses, they don't always have that type of resource. So then they're relying on companies like us to be able to help them identify those risks as well. Precisely. Um, yeah, so I, I, you kind of expressed and answered the third question already about like, why are they important? Um, so let's jump into like, how do you personally use risk assessments for yourself? Or uh, I for think yourself? everyone uh, is constantly in a risk assessment mode. Interesting. Okay. I, 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 I shared with you that I just had a total hip replacement done two weeks ago. That's right. Right. Three weeks ago, when we were talking about the risk of me walking from my car to the house, right? Mm -hmm. I would not be identifying a whole lot of exposure. Mm -hmm. Today, I see a lot of exposure. <laughs> you know, I can't put all the weight on my on my leg. I have to have some kind of support, whether it's a cane or a walker. You know, while I'm going through recovery, and now I've got this apparatus I have to use. So I'm going down the the the, the sidewalk, and there are grooves that it hangs up in. Yeah. Uh, or somebody has a loose uh, uh, carpet laying on the floor that it gets hot, it cause it could cause a drip hazard. So yeah. forth and so on. But all of us apply risk assessment to our daily lives, whether it's simple things like that, or it's how we're dealing with money, or how we're deciding on uh, uh, recreation for the weekend. Sure. Yes, I, I actually, um, Gary and I had a good conversation about hip replacement because I have to do some, uh, I have some hip surgery in my future. And um, one of the things I tell my trainer is I have to choose if I'm going to train today or if I'm going to walk my dogs. And, you know, I'm, I'm not old enough in my brain to have to deal with that kind of stuff. And so it's really frustrating. But now it's becoming that 
if I want to not lay down all day tomorrow, I have to make that choice. I can't do both until I have the surgery and get through the healing process. That so. is a beautiful word picture you gave there because that is what risk management really is about. Trade-off decisions. Trade-off decisions. Good. We're, we've got a risk to something going uh, off the rails, right? I can choose to spend money to assure that that's going to stay on the rails, or I can roll the dice and say, most likely we'll be fine. Somebody has to make that decision, but the information needed to make that decision is why we do risk assessment. It's not to comply with a regulation. That's right. It's to drive decision making, which goes back to what I said earlier, creates value. Yes. So I another way that I applied risk assessment after our first conversation, I, I tell my friends and I even post on social media about it, that the first time Gary and I spoke, I felt smarter in 30 minutes and I like Thank I you. started applying, I immediately applied the risk assessment to my to-do list. So I was like, okay. I have this to do. What's the impact if I don't do it? And we'll talk more about negative and positive impact in a few slides. Um, but, you know, like I, I was able to apply it to my to do list and that helped me prioritize what I needed to do first. And it was so simple. But at the same time, I was just like, I've never approached this that way. I usually just have a check off list and I approach it. You know, I, I, I somewhat assess like what's easiest to get done and knock off my list, but I've not looked at it from a risk approach. And I, I really thought that that was a clever new use for me. So, well, let's, let's jump into the next section and talk more about the enterprise risk management, or as we know, ERM, and how, mm -hmm. how does risk assessment fit into an ERM system or approach? Uh, enterprise risk management mandates that you I, go through the risk management process, which it includes assessing risk. Um, organizations take on different frameworks to do this. Some take very much a top-down approach to this uh, assessment. Others a bottom-up. Uh, the, the whole purpose of this now is to have a portfolio of these risks that I can be uh, managing, understanding, and taking action to on an ongoing basis. So, okay. so if 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 you can think about your going back to your day to day life, there are portfolios of hazards and risks that you're concerned with throughout your day. You're taking action to manage all these different things. With ERM, what we're saying as an organization, we need to reset, reevaluate on a periodic basis. To see what's changed. So, can, so are there kind new of a management? project management approach to risk. It's very much like uh, um, uh, uh, Lean Six Sigma or yeah. uh, was it OPM? Was that the operational project management? Yes, uh, or PMP. Or, uh, a lot of those methods are all very similar, and ERM really adopted those concepts. The only difference was rather than looking at a uh, constraint or an, an a, a obstruction to productivity, you're looking at a probable risk event. Yes. And that event is what is going to cause the disruption. Now, if we want to be getting into the anatomy of this a little bit, when I know what the this event is, then it's sort of like in the center of a bow tie. And many people in the audience have done bow tie analysis, but these events have two different sides to them. The left side is the causal side. So this is where we start getting into factors, right? What are things that could cause this event to happen? Mm -hmm. Bring rise to it happening. And then if it does happen on the right-hand side, I can talk about how that would affect my organization. Makes so sense. I'm, I'm totally taking notes while we're talking. <laughs> so if, if you can think about those types of things, this is where that whole language thing gets to be uh, interesting, right? People will often call factors risks and risks factors and they get them all mixed up. Yeah. 
we get right. we trip on our words a lot too mm -hmm. so like we i know my, even myself i do this often where i feel that i understand what i'm trying to say but i sometimes need a translator um you know to I, was I was training in monterey mexico uh last year and um i was training on how to take a quantitative and analy analysis approach to risk assessment. And a question came up from somebody. He said, well, wait a minute, if you're saying that, that there are causes to events, but couldn't an event cause another event? And I said, yes, but does it make it less of an event on its own? It might be a cause to event two, but it's its own event with its own causes in its own right mm -hmm. and it was like the world blew up on him right <laughs> you know, well then I, yeah because then how do you go about doing because now you have the risk if i have this happen mm -hmm. and is the new cause of a new risk and now i have to evaluate if both risks happen then this, you know the causes right. So this is what we try to do with ERM, take this portfolio view of these risks and see how they're interconnected and interrelated. Because if I can understand an absolute root cause and can manage that one root cause, I might be able to avoid or eliminate a whole host of risks downstream. Right, right. So... And, when you yeah. and I talked uh, originally, that's what I told you about food safety. I think this perfectly fits this model, right? Mm -hmm. If you're taking care of the right things early, the things downstream don't become a problem to you. That's right. We, I've, um, so that's a big way that I describe HACCP versus the preventive controls plans that we now have to do due to regulation. So I kind of use like HACCP is the last point in the um, in the process that you can control the hazard and you control it there. And that's mm -hmm. your main, what we call critical control point. In preventive controls, you're controlling it every step of every, you know, of the entire process. So you're managing it and trying to stop it from even coming in the door if it's associated with your raw materials mm -hmm. and then managing it each step of the way too. So it, it's very much a similar process but I think it's really important for us to, 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 you know, again, we have a lot of food safety professionals on the, on the call, but when you're looking at it from a corporate level, from an enterprise risk management, food safety is one sliver of this pie that I think, you yeah. know, we kind of get, we get tunnel vision in our roles if we're not careful and don't understand the other risks that the association is going through or the, the organization. Right. How does food safety relate to some other 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 key risks to the organization? Yeah. And yeah. We'll, we'll and you talk about find some that of you're that. A value creator, or you could be finding yourself to be a potential obstacle just by yes. having to answer that question. Oh, you just hit their hearts because that's one thing that as a food safety professional we have to do is we sometimes you know we're doom and gloom in our approach, and so we do become an obstacle of getting things done and it's that risk adverse behavior and mindset that we have that we 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 have a hard time with that flexibility because we are so fear-based on what what will happen instead of trying to mitigate it and work together as a team on how to prevent what our known risks are and construction is a great way to look at it like you're expanding a company um, maybe a facility and you have construction going on a, a food safety person would rather not do that kind of construction if they didn't have to or do it on a day that the production's not running to prevent cross-contamination. Right. However, you walk into any facility that's doing construction, they're a lot of times running production really near it. And so then it's like, well, how, how are they making those decisions to prevent cross-contamination and where are they getting that mindset? And sometimes you're, you'll walk in and notice the maintenance team and the um, you know the supervision supervisory team are having conversations, but they're forgetting to include the food safety professional in the building. And so right. it's I mean it's really important both directions at that point to have it's, really it's interesting the way you're describing this. It's like um, 
do you, do you remember uh, the movie called National Treasure? Yes. With, uh, was it Nicolas Cage? I yep, guess. Yep. I just watched that over the holidays. <laughs> now, if you remember, there was a set of, they found a set of, of uh, spectacles that were apparently uh, Benjamin Franklin's that had these different colors to them. And when they put them on just right, they could see the map to the treasure. Yes. You have to think of enterprise risk or this enterprise risk philosophy as kind of like putting on those goggles. You're, yeah. you're, you're seeing how things interrelate that you didn't see before. And by doing that, senior management need to start to include at the table people that belong there, such as food safety. Right. Right. And food safety needs to raise their game, right? Yes. Yeah. Because they have a lot more to offer. Yeah. And yeah. so that it, it, that's the way you need to think about enterprise risk is interconnectivity, how it all interrelates into the overall organizational strategy, goals, and and business processes. And, Absolutely. And, you know, you know, we're all part of the COGS in that wheel. I've always thought of URM as being very much an umbrella concept. Many will debate me on this, but uh, I believe it really has a big tent and we're yeah. all part of it. I would agree with that from my perspective. You know, like I have a compliance background and most of it is food safety. However, I was engaged in ethical and sustainability um, and legal compliance when I was at Kroger. And I always looked at it as well as an umbrella from compliance perspective. And I, I did try to, it gave me insight of the risks that we had and how we have to make decisions to keep moving forward. Yep. regardless of the compliance in the internal company you know we we're we make steps to improve it the entire time so it's always a work in progress and i think you said it earlier it's never finished right no, so it's never finished and you, you the world are always changing, doing this the world keeps changing yeah. around us right and yeah everything needs to be able to adapt as that is happening and i, I think having these kinds of processes in place make you more resilient as an organization absolutely uh, is you're looking, right? Yeah. You're looking and adapting on an ongoing basis. Yes. Okay, well, let's let's jump into, I have a poll question and I'm going to put the Perry Johnson team to work because I'm going to ask, um, do you currently use risk assessments in your operation, yes or no? Um, so when you respond to that, but if you say yes, can you also go into the chat box and explain how you use the uh, risk assessments in your facility. And I'm assuming and hopeful that most food safety people will say that they're using it in food safety, but if you're using it in other ways, we would love to hear that. All right, we have the pull up right now. I'm gonna leave it for another 15 seconds or so. Okay. And then don't forget, once your poll is closed, because um, I don't know if you'll have access to the chat until it closes, but once it closes, if you answered yes, please jump in and say how you're using it. And that's in the, you have a chat section that you can send to everyone. All right, I'm gonna close the poll up. It looks like we have some responses in. It's about 87% yes, 13 no. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm well, keeping an eye on the chat right now. Okay, thank you. That's I appreciate that. That's very encouraging. Well, my uh, my hope, and I'm guessing based on the percentages that we had, Gary, that most of the group is going to be saying they're using it in food safety as well. Um, before we jump into evaluate impact, I do want to see, you know, because you're consulting with your company. I, overall, are you seeing? that companies lack an ERM system? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. You know, companies so claim I, they do things, but they're not really doing them. Yes. Right? Yeah, I mean, like even your conversations making me look at it from our perspective, like we have projects, but honestly, I don't, like we're not doing risk in that same thought pattern. So it makes me want to improve our process as well. Um, and so I'm, I'm imagine a lot of people will be saying the same thing 
So I, I, I was at a seminar one time and there was an expert in the panel and they were talking about their experience with their organization and how they were evolving enterprise risk. And they made a claim. They said, you know, when we got started with this, we knew of about 200 risks. Today, we now know of 5,000 risks in the organization. Oh, my word. Wow. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you yeah. think that's an, effect, an effective ERM program? Or do you think that they have lost their way? Uh, I Like, to me, too much information is hard to manage. So I I would say that they're overkill. Um, to yeah, a degree, they, they and that some of those risks trap might of be... management, right? They fell yeah. into the trap of, you know, knowledge is power. I need lots of lists, but nothing was actionable. Yeah, yeah. And that I'm, I'm going to guarantee you that it, that what I talked about earlier about people putting in factors as risks and so forth was part of that. So when yeah. they when they began to to look at their ERM program, risk identification without judgment was their core culture. The the problem with that is, is that there is a difference between a risk and a factor. Yeah, okay. And well, so, you know. Is that gonna lean into the next topic of discussion with evaluating impact? Sure, uh, now <laughs> evaluation methodologies can take different approaches. So uh, most common out there are folks that use scales, so they will typically uh, create an algorithm that would be likelihood times impact, and then create an overall score for their organization. Now, if you remember back when we were talking about um, the bow tie, uh -huh. if, if an event occurs, it's going to have an impact on my business. Understanding what those things are, are important to being able to determine what that level of impact might be. Mm -hmm. Now, we are big proponents of going quantitative with this. So uh, Boeing uh, for many years has used something that they call the PERT method, a PERT uh, model for statistical modeling. And rather than doing likelihood scale of one to five and impact scale of one to five, they've gone as far as saying what's the probability of the event occurring and they come up with three different quantitative in dollars terms impact scenarios and they let a Monte Carlo simulation engine drive out the statistical outputs. Now the power of that is is that now when I'm looking at that output I'm seeing an exposure, let's say it's put in the food safety context, that if I do, if I get impacted by this particular food safety risk, and you can fill in the blank, being the expert in that area, then I could see a loss or a financial loss to my organization to a half a million dollars next year. Yeah. So that, so now, going back to those trade-off decisions we were talking about, it makes it a lot easier to say, well, doesn't it make sense for us to spend $10,000 to bring that half a million down to, to $1,000? That's right, that's right. Yeah, and, and you know, there's, we'll talk about that in the case study too. So I have some examples that I think um, at the end that we'll talk through. Um, in interest of time, I do want to just ask, can you explain um positive or negative impact so that people understand like you're quantitatively but when you're right. doing so going back to our erm portfolio right you can yeah. have impacts that have both a positive or a negative effect on the organization so right. something could happen but it could actually create an opportunity for you um great story i i i, <laughs> I, I heard this story one time i don't know if it's true but it's a great story to pass on. Everyone feel free, but please uh, put the non-disclosure on there that uh, <laughs> I don't know if this is true or not. But the story goes that uh, uh, Augie Bush of the Anheuser-Busch family, we're going back a long time ago, okay, is in his, in, in his limousine on the way to the office 
and he's looking out the window and noticing that there are a lot of Budweiser cans laying in the gutters. So he gets to the office, he's very distraught by this. He calls his executive team together and he says, guys, we've got to do something. Budweiser is becoming the brand of bums and derelicts. All I saw was Budweiser cans littered all over the, the city in the, in the curbs on the way in the office. So his team, they all went away to try to figure out how they're going to address this, right? So this is obviously a risk to Budweiser, right? Yeah. They, they have a reputational issue going on here and Augie needs it resolved. So he goes to the marketing people, of course, and they're like, well, we need to rebrand ourselves. We need to get, the, get Budweiser out of the hands of the folks that would be litterers. So they're talking about changing pricing, changing the brand look, a full-blown advertising campaign. It was an enormously expensive campaign to do this. Sure. The operations guys come in very sm in, in a smug tone and said, boss, we just need to pick them up. <laughs> and he said, well, what are you trying to say? You're being a smart, Alex? He said, no, we went and did our analysis. If we can go and get our our uh, uh, customers themselves to pick these cans up and bring them back to us, we can create recycling centers and save five cents a can or a half a billion dollars a year. To reinvest. So the opportunity side of this was we can trim cost by leveraging what's already happening and then let our customers deal with it versus trying to completely change it all, which what the marketing people would have done. Right. Two, two different ways of looking at the same event. Mm. That's yeah, it's very unique. And I, I, I just saw another one and I'm curious your thought on it. Um, Domino's Pizza has been advertising snow removal and they're looking at it like they can't get the, I'm assuming and let, I'm going to put my risk management hat on and think okay. they're seeing now, what, what state is this in because in Maryland that would not be happening <laughs> I, well it, it's in I'm in Indiana and I'm watching okay. it on stream so I'm not sure where their intended audience is but my assumption is Indiana right okay. so they're saying we are doing snow removal for you and and I don't know what the full breadth of the service is, but I just imagine that they're trying to say, I can't get my pizza delivered to you and you're not going to get it on time or meet our metrics. Snow is in the way. So why don't we just also remove the snow at a, a slight cost difference and then we'll be able to give more, you know, get more pizza to the door. That's, a, that's almost the same exact use case, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's. It's and that's brilliant. And I have to say, Domino's lately has been very good in how they're managing their strategic risk. Absolutely. Yeah, because they have some other things going on too, like they're offering a free pizza in an emergency. Um, so you can have, yeah. like if you sign up for their app, you can, and I'm not, I don't have any stock in Domino's, so disclaimer there. Um, but I just noticed that they also have, they're putting an app out there and saying, um, you know, we'll we'll offer you free pizza emergency one time uh, if you need it, if you just sign up for the app. So um, we are getting really close to the top. So I'm going to scoot through some more questions okay. and then we'll get to the case study. So um, how can risk management help us better prioritize? I think we've kind of talked a little bit about this, but around our compliance efforts around a standard. So I want to kind of bring it back to our core audience who are looking at, I need to get compliant to what my customer requirements are, can they use risk management to help them better prioritize those efforts? Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, but, but if, if they're taking a risk view, so rather than not, not a compliance view, but a risk view, mm -hmm. and they can understand, and maybe I should step away for a second, Jennifer. Every if you're an advanced or mature compliance officer, you should be able to run the lines from compliance back to the risks that compliance is asking you to do. So you yeah. should already know what those, those risks are. So if I can then have a broader risk assessment 
to assess the risks before compliance, I can then make a determination which one of my compliance efforts are, are most critical. Sure. It's like taking an inherent risk view of the organization before you decide which compliance efforts you will do. Right. I yep. once saw an assessment done for cybersecurity. And in the cybersecurity, they were using a known standard, the CIS 18, uh, I think version 8 standard. And the, the first question was, did you implement this control? It was either fully implemented, partially, or not at all, right? Mm -hmm. And then the second question was, well, what if you did not implement it? How much exposure or risk are you putting yourself in, the organization in, by not doing it? Now, that's fascinating. Yeah. Because, because now what they're saying is, is that if it is a very risky situation and I don't comply, I should prioritize all my efforts on those guys, right? Mm -hmm. But if it's extremely low risk and I have not complied, it's not the top priority. That makes sense. That makes sense. And that's exactly what I'm currently doing with some projects that we have in Safe Aid and Root. So I'm, I'm assessing the risk and determining the probability of the risk and the negative impact it might happen you know if we ignore it if we ignore that risk what the negative impact will be so I'm, I'm really trying to improve my behavior so what you just described is what I'm trying to do internally so what like did that help that company I assume it helped that company oh, immensely that immensely now, yeah right out of the gate they know where they need to put their efforts right yeah. and also understand that these are a high priority because they're a high risk as well. So that it puts sure. a little bit more urgency on compliance on those areas where you have higher inherent risk. Yeah. Well, let's let's jump into evaluation a little bit more. Um, and so, you know, how would we go about evaluating those risks? Like what you just gave an example. So can you reshare that example and maybe some other right, so ways? Another that example would be I'm uh, I'm looking at it from a compliance perspective here, but say a food safety standard, I uh -huh. would be I would be looking at the level of compliance on a food lit, uh, food safety standard as one dimension, and the other dimension is how much inherent risk am I putting my organization in if I do not comply with that? Yes. What's interesting about that question is that one element could be that auditors think of this very highly and you're going to get in a lot of trouble, right? Right. The other side of it is in my organization, I really just don't have the exposure to make this control so important to me. Right. So I can now better prioritize by multiplying the two together. Say you have a score of one three and five on implementation and a one to five score on risk i now have a max score of a 25 so anything that is in the 25s and 20s and 15 score range i'm dealing with those things first right that makes yeah, sense so using yeah. a multiplier effect because with the risk assessments that we're told to do in food safety um i some people use that scoring factor but others just use like high and, and high, medium, low kind of thing. And they're not doing it from a quantitative perspective, but they might well, do it from- You want to have some time. way to, to, to push out where my exposure and my priorities need to be. And another, yeah. another approach to this, like I mentioned before, you know, if, if I can point back to what the key risks are that compliance people are asking for, okay? And I can then allow room for some ad hoc risk identification and now apply a likelihood times impact score on the risks. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna be then uh, mapping those risks to those compliance areas, same approach, right? Those which have high risk and, uh, and those uh, uh, compliance requirements that align with my higher risk should be the highest priority. So I wanna make sure I heard that right, because again, I'm taking notes and learning. Um, so if I'm looking at the compliance as one multiplying factor, and then the impact if I don't comply, 
and then the likelihood of that impact occurring if I don't comply. Is that right. correct? Right. Okay, so, so then another, you'd be multiplying yeah. all three of those together, and then the highest score is your number one focus. But now you're getting another element, right? You're looking at a likelihood of there being an issue or not, right? You're yeah. bringing that into the equation. And then well, I mentioned before, sense. you can go full-blown quantitative if you want to and look at each risk and say, what's the probability of the, of, of the risk occurring, right, first? And then if it occurs, how bad would it be to me? Right in dollars terms. So now I've got the risks organized in a priority list. If I know how my compliance efforts align to those risks, then I can know which compliance compliance effort should be first versus last. That makes sense. Okay, so we are really close. Um, I do want to invite um, Chris. I saw your post to the audience if anyone has any questions. Um, so keep me posted if anybody has jumped in on questions. The case study that I put, we've kind of talked to it already. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do want to just kind of jump in and say, okay, like, let's talk about one situation example. So like you're going for a standard, you're making the, the marketing decision, I want to go for the standard. And so do you prioritize getting the certification or not and why? And so this is kind of looking at it from that holistic ERM perspective more than the compliance to the standard. Right. And so I would look at it like my case study would be, first you need to understand your gaps to the standard as part of your um, information that you're collecting, right? So like you would want to do a gap assessment. How close am I to it? Mm -hmm. What's the impact of those certification requirements? to my business financially, what's the risk if I don't get it? So the impact if I decide not to get it. And so this is usually my marketing ploy to people to go ahead and get one of the GFSI audit schemes because many companies uh, that are not certified are not even considered as part of the bid process for a private label in any of the larger organizations. So the Kroger's, the Target's, Walmart's, they don't even want to include you in their bid process unless you have one of these standards because then they know you have a basic set of guidance that you're you're following. They're going um, down that causal chain again, right? I'm not certified. Yeah. And since I'm not certified, then you just created a new event. I do yes. not qualify to bid. Yes. Yeah. So that that was kind of my case study from a food safety perspective. But again, it's not it's not the same as if I don't mitigate this you know, kill step, if I don't do this kill step to make sure that I'm cooking the food properly. And I'm so like, there's several little nuances through getting compliance to mm -hmm. these requirements or to regulatory compliance as well. Like if you don't, so we have a saying in the industry, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Um, and so the impact of not documenting, if you don't have a documentation process, you don't have standard operating procedures, you don't have policies in place, which are what these schemes request, right? So if you don't have that in place, then you're kind of out the door. Um, okay, I see that I've got five minutes, so let's do one more poll question because I'm running out of time. This is such a fabulous conversation. Um, so how much did this webinar help you with your understanding of risk assessments? And I will let Parker take over. Yep, I just started the poll, so I'll let it run for a little bit. Okay. It's amazing yes. when you start talking about risk, you can you can talk for hours about it. I know, it's so easy to, and I can apply it so much. I think I heard Chris jump in too. Did you jump in to say something, Chris? I sure did. While we're looking at the poll, also had a couple of questions come in from the audience. I thought we could just pull a double duty here. Okay. Uh, can your risk assessment um tools identify root cause and evaluate continual improvements absolutely uh, the risk management process itself lends itself to identifying root cause and then actually gives you the mechanisms to uh, correct those things and show how that changes your whole risk profile so yes, the methodologies and the automation that we're bringing to bear uh, provide the solution to all those things you're asking for. Fantastic, so, and then a follow-up question to that. So 
since the audience today is a lot of QA people with, you know, no real budget of their own, um, how do you convince a boss or, you know, a, a team uh, to spend the money to better manage ongoing risk levels? Do you have any, um, I guess, common things that you've seen work out in the marketplace? Uh, Jennifer, you want to tackle that? Or you want me to? <laughs> you go ahead. I, I'll okay. jump in I, with more. I, I would say what I, we mentioned the quantitative method before. If you can assess risk in dollars terms, uh, that is the language of the C-suite. If they can see the cost benefit of doing versus not doing, it gets their attention. The key to that is the inputs can't be your own. They have to be management's input. They need to be the ones giving you the data that the Monte Carlo simulation engine drives. And by the way, the tools we use that Jennifer was talking about earlier already have Monte Carlo simulation engines built in. So um, it can be done. Um, the, the other methodology, and it's, it's always the tough thing in risk management is buy-in, um, is connecting those dots, right? Making sure they understand that Food safety is not a standalone compliance problem. It relates to revenue. It relates to fines and costs and other issues in operations. So that properly knowing that, that not doing something can lead to lower revenue or, low, or higher cost is an important distinction that needs to be made. Those dots must be connected. It's a fantastic answer. So results of the poll, 74% uh, learned a lot today. We've got 26% of the audience uh, that found it was helpful, but still trying to wrap their head around it. So <laughs> do you have any last words or um, I guess talk a little bit about how they can follow up with you if they have any questions that they didn't get a chance to ask today? Yeah, well, this is a perfect segue to the slide that I pulled up. So we have created the Culture Advisory Group, Safe Food and Root, and Aperitasoft has created this mini assessment for you to try. So if you scan this QR code or go to the link that is provided underneath the email, um, you will get asked for your contact information and then we will send you a mini assessment to fill out um, for your organization. It's free. Um, it will absolutely take you through some of these um, risks that we are talking about. It's not a food safety one. It's actually leadership, finance, operations, and marketing risks that we're just helping you kind of have a higher level point of view. And then you can get an idea of how the, um, the tool works. Um, the email, just as a heads up, will come from aperitasoft at rpm3solutions.com. So make sure that's in your safe senders uh, or safe yeah safe senders list um so that you can receive it but also check your junk mail just in case um and then we'll reach out that way or um we're also happy uh and we'll send this link i think i i put that link in the chat if chris can add it into the chat for the audience that'd be fantastic um then the other way to connect with uh safe food and root so that we can talk more about how to build the risk assessment tool around your certification programs. So we already have one launched for VRCGS and we're working on SQFI and the FSSC 22,000 uh, versions. And so if you want more information about that, reach out to Hebe, um, our Director of Business Development, and we will be happy to start that conversation as well. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank everyone on the panel today. Thank you so much for the great content. Um, look forward to, you know, many more of these in the future. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to either Perry Johnson Food Safety or to uh, directly to Safe Food and Root or Apertisoft. Thank you so much for your time today and have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Really appreciate the conversation. Oh, it's an honor to be here, Jennifer. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> Absolutely. Again, Great I job. feel smarter after hanging out with you. Great okay. job, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. All right. Well, I think we're wrapped up. So people are topping off, and um, we'll see you on the other side. See you on the other side. <laughs>